You know, sometimes we have to have a cough drop, that is, to start a show. But we're going to start this show without a cough drop. I've got a cold. You don't. Uh, you're doing a great job speaking tonight. I'm not. And uh, I'd like to talk about a little uh, bit of this and that, mostly in politics. I hear that you're really, 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 really interested in making uh, possibly this impact on the state of Texas. Talk to me about it. Well, you know, when Bernie ran, uh, he said that uh, that people needed to get more involved. Yes. In politics, not just not just at the not just as voting, which of course people needed to do. You know, we've seen demonstrated why people need to vote, and at least I hope that when the next election comes around, that we won't be like we traditionally have been, where uh, Democrats and uh, left-leaning independents typically don't vote in the midterms. Right. I think we've learned our lesson. I would like to think that the people have woken up and realized what, the, what an important thing that is. But he wanted people to get involved in politics directly, like running for office. And I've had the pleasure of interviewing a number of people, I think it was uh, maybe a half a dozen by now, who uh, were inspired by that to, to run for office where they never would have before. You know, it was considered some lofty position that was unattainable for common people. And uh, I've introduced, or I've, excuse me, I've interviewed a handful of people that are either running for the state senate in their various states or they're running for the U.S. Senate for the first time. And uh, one or two that had already run previously and lost that wanted to get out on the podcast and, and give it uh, advice and pointers to other people. And I'm, I'm excited about seeing an awakening of all these people, an awakening of an interest you know, yes. in, in taking the helm of uh, our political system and becoming way more involved than we have been. You know, I was, a lot of people have this impression that they're never going to be capable or have an influence on anything and one of the strange things about the the internet world is the way that people achieve an ability to to express a voice you know to share their talent you know do things that they weren't they wouldn't under the current or the previous system they weren't able to to share all of these things they weren't able to get their opinions out they weren't able to learn as well as they are they certainly weren't able to connect and network the way that they can now yes you know so i've been uh, i've been part of a number of different marches and protests and political actions in the last year or two that were all uh, orchestrated by social media and people have uh, raised their awareness and their understanding so much over so many different things that uh, it's actually encouraging and these are make no mistake these are dark times right you know i mean i'm i have great concerns for not just the economy and not just you know the our the quality of life or the uh you know, the, the normal aspects that people would, would be concerned with in everyday politics. I mean, I'm concerned also about the environment, and I don't think we had four years to, to go to something that, to a, a, and a regime, if you will, that wants to deny that climate change is even a possibility or that, that humanity has any effect on the environment. Clearly, we have an effect on the environment. I think sure. it takes the greatest denial to say otherwise. Then there's a lot of dark things that we could talk about in the environment that I don't want to go into right now. I want to stay with the with the, the possible hopeful, which is that people are realizing that, you know, maybe maybe we can wrest the, the rest control away from the powers that be and change direction from where we were. And I like to see that, uh, uh, as I mentioned before in a previous conversation that you and I had, I, I have a friend who is a Republican Party delegate. And he and I agree on very little. I mean, he's a Christian creationist and all of this, but an old friend. And he and I agree on one thing, and that is that the uh, the establishment in both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party need to be replaced. And so I identify as a Bernie Crat. I I I resonate with the um, uh, our revolution or the Justice Democrats. You know, we're trying. We're out to reform the party, and. Yeah, I understand that in this last election, there's a lot of finger pointing as to where blame is, and I'm, I'm doing I'm doing the same. I can I can recognize that there are several things that you know both sides did that were wrong, and I'm right. and there's quite a lot that the Democrats did to themselves to effectively shoot themselves in the foot. But this is what we're trying to change. You know, the Democratic Party in this last election was not in touch with the common people. I mean, they didn't follow the 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 platform that they claimed to hold. You know where they're supposed to represent the, the you know the the um, the concerns of the everyday people. You know, I mean, th this was 
This was a demonstration of oligarchy. I mean, the very thing that, that Bernie Sanders was complaining about. You know, I, I had the uh, privilege of being able to make it up to Standing Rock and see what was going on there. And it, I, I was excited to see this because this was a focal point of real change in this country. This was where we saw, and this, mind you, this is before the election. This was before we had a, a suspicion that the election was going to go the way that it did. We were already seeing, under Obama, we were seeing that this was, uh, this was a situation where the corporations that run this country are going to do what they want to do, and it no longer matters what we, the people, have to say about that. Well, let me ask you a question when you talk about corporations, because it's important to me. Um, when I look at what corporate America is doing, I can't dismiss the fact that the media is owned, in a sense, by these corporations. Yeah. And so when we talk about corporate um, problems, we've got to address the media. I looked at Bernie Sanders like this. I said, he's not actually getting the kind of coverage from the media that he needs to be getting because uh, the media, they focus in on two narratives, the Republican Party narrative and the Democratic Party narrative. And they were trying to interpret, if you will, through the lens of their own hermeneutic, that is, they have two different models they study, they research, and they do a very good job at sticking with that narrative. But they would start conflating, conflating what Bernie was saying with what, uh, at first, what uh, Hillary Clinton was saying. And this is, this is something that keeps happening. And I, I think that we need some journalists that can actually exegete, that is, to pull out what Bernie was saying as opposed to what Hillary was saying so they can understand the differences between those two candidates. People were drawn to Bernie because he could go to Liberty University and say, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you something that's radically different to your worldview. But he could state it in such a way that they would open up their ears, open up their minds. I saw something dynamic. I saw something fresh. I've never seen that in my lifetime in politics. And yet, it was the media that actually carried the narrative of the Democratic Party and the Repu Republican Party. And I think this is why uh, Americans are, uh, you know, just shaken right now. We, we don't know what to do in a sense, but yet we do know what to do. We've got to get back to some basics. We've got to see a narrative come along that's for the people. And it's going to come from a movement that's like Bernie Sanders started. He truly had a movement. He had a movement of thinking people. He had a movement of people who wanted to progressively change America. We're talking about education was a priority. It wasn't put you know, on the back burner. He was talking about the economy. He was talking about health care. We're talking about a need here. We're not talking about a desire. We're talking about a need, health care. I mean, think about all these politicians. They're debating over Obamacare versus whatever care right now. Yeah. And my God, I mean, why can't we understand that Americans, I don't care who you are, if you're, if you're a foreigner, you need health care. We should have enough love and compassion in our hearts to simply say, listen, that person is bleeding. They need health care. Why is that such a struggle, Arnra? Talk to me. <laughs> Where are the compassionists? Oh yeah, well, why is it that the United States pays more for farm, uh, you know, for our, uh, pharmaceuticals than anybody else? I mean, why are we the only country that doesn't provide health care the way? You know, we, I've been to several countries throughout Europe and New Zealand and Australia. I've seen how other countries operate, and they are much more efficient than we are, and they're much more green than we are. And we just don't seem to realize that we have any responsibility for what we do, which is upsetting since we make the biggest mess. It's true. You know, I mean, globally, the United States consumes the most resources, produces the most pollution, and we are completely self-centered. I mean, you know, when, when do you ever think about you know, what goes on in Zimbabwe? But people in Zimbabwe are always aware of what's going on in America because we also make the most noise. You know, I, I wish that... In the old days of the old, uh, the old fashion of media that we used to have, I wish there was some way of just having worldwide news that was actually worldwide news and would talk about a plane crash in Nepal, even if there were no number of Americans that were involved. You remember the way the news used to say, you know, four Americans were? Right. 
you know, it doesn't matter if Americans are involved in other people's business. We should hear the news globally, right? Because we're part of this globe, yes. like everybody else. And there, well, I was told uh, that, that we're the richest country in the world, and so somehow we can't afford to do what much poorer countries can do and have done for quite a long time. I've been, I've been told that, that the national health care system in all these uh, European countries has already failed. But then, you know, the national health care system for, for the UK, for example, has been going on since, what, World War II? You know, and my British friends, I have a few, right, have never had an ill word to say about their NHS. And they said that when they, when they originally got that, that they went through the exact same controversies that we're going through now, where, of course, the insurance companies were complaining that we can't have this, and uh, the, the, the surgical organizations, the pharmaceutical companies, they're all arguing that we can't do this. But then it was done, right, in England. And then now, nobody can speak against the NHS because it would be political suicide to do so. And that's what would happen in the United States if we actually got an NHS system, you know, where... I, I won, I'm one who supports that we don't need to pay so much more for our military than absolutely everybody. And I kind of think that if we had an effective foreign policy and actually had diplomats, then maybe we wouldn't need to have all the guns in the world. You know, because maybe if we just don't piss off everybody, then maybe it's not necessary to be armed all the time. Now, here you go. You're an atheist preaching peace. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a subject. Uh, what an item. Keep preaching. Well, I just, I see the way that the United States has done a lot of things. And I want to be patriotic. I, want to, I was raised by a very down-home country kind of family that we were raised to believe that this is the you know, best damn country there is, right? And I want to believe that. But I can't, you know. I've I've seen that we are like number thirty-seven in certain scholastic scores, and you know we're 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 on different numbers for different metrics all over the board. I don't think if you could take an average of somebody that's number one, I don't think it would be the United States because we don't seem to be number one in anything, really anymore. We used to have the best universities in the world, but now people are turning their students to other universities, you know, in, in other countries more often. Uh, I think we still have slightly the edge right. on people coming to, to college in the United States, but we're losing that because more and more students are turning to go to other countries. And I liked being the intellectual leader. I mean, I, I live in Texas, right? And Texas has, you know, the, the, the Houston Space Center, right? We have, we have some excellent universities in Texas. We have a lot, that we had uh, industrial companies that we can be proud of that, you know, that, that they're, these places are based in Texas. But that's not the common opinion of Texas. Nobody's aware anymore of these you know, universities that we have at our disposal. Instead, what they're aware of is our uh, notorious, infamous you know, Board of Education and uh, the, all the dominionists that are running every level of our government, just, just embarrassing us constantly. I mean, we had, we had as our governor, George W. Bush, Right, Please and then we had it. after that we had Rick Perry, right? <laughs> oh my, my goodness! And you guys probably don't know about the guy that has replaced him, but every bit is bad, and everybody and all of his uh, his uh, successors or uh, supporters in, in, or assistants, if you will, subordinates in his office, just as bad. I mean, we got horror stories for almost all of them. I mean, one of those people. I can't remember his name right now. There was there was a famous filibuster a few years ago where one woman managed to do a filibuster wearing a catheter to keep herself from from having to to to, to take a break from that. She managed to stand and talk for eleven and a half hours on behalf of women's rights. And uh, I wish I could remember his name. It's so embarrassing now. The uh, the guy in charge uh, at that point. When they, when they finally got her off that, when they finally were able to take a break from that, they were only minutes away from midnight, and there was a huge uproar. The, the crowd managed to go berserk and, and stay everything until midnight, right? So they pushed the boundary over. They'd done enough stalling and enough roaring and everything that nobody could take a vote. And so then the, the guy, I wish I could remember his name, he actually fudged the date on the document under the, the uh, CD cameras that were... You know, he, he didn't know that there's 180,000 online witnesses at this moment. So he's fudged the date on this document to say that the date that the vote took place on time. 
And it took three hours to explain to this guy that there were 180,000 witnesses and that they all know. They screenshotted and they know what he did. Was he charged? No. Hmm. Because our politicians get to walk. They get to, they get to perform crimes that any of us would, would have been you know, penalized for, and they just get to walk without any indictment at all. What, are they immune? You know, this, this needs to change. We have such a corrupt system that we're not in a position to complain about other countries being corrupt. Look how corrupt we are. You know, and the more you, you, the more you start you know, watching news stories, and hopefully from multiple different sources, because you're right, you know, we have unreliable media. We have some grassroots journalist sources that can be very good, but you, you've got to have a bit of skepticism with whatever, wherever you get your news from, right? And you know, mix and compare. You know, the thing that scares me uh, when you look at the facts, if you're raised in, let's say, family A, mm -hmm. you grow up with a certain norm. If you're, if you're raised in family B, you have a different norm. And so if someone from family A gets married to someone in family B, uh, one of the problems that's going to come up is, you know, my norm is not like your norm. And so, you know, it, it's going to take some time to adjust a bit just to have a relationship with them. And the thing that I see today that's happening that truly bothers me, it's, it's really troubling, is that so many people are becoming nationalist. That is, in the sense of disconnecting themselves from everyone on the planet. And it's all about America. Yeah. And that scares the hell out of me. That's yeah. like seeing this family over here, A, can completely disconnect themselves from family B. My set of norms is what we're going to live by, and I don't give a damn about family B. That scares me, and I see that being pontificated day in and day out. That scares me, and this is why I think people need to rethink their position that is on patriotism. I, I think that we, we should be proud, namely of ourselves first, uh, proud of our relationships with our family members, like I'm so proud of my wife, my children, my grandchildren. Uh, yes, I'm proud to be an American, but I'm not going to overreach with that. Uh, I'm very, very proud of people from other countries. I've got to learn from other cultures. I've got to grow. I don't want to say my norm is the greatest, it's the best, and park my mind. I would like to learn from others. So many other countries are doing magical things in a sense uh, compared to us in education concerning uh, just something as simple as algebra. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, some countries are out actually teaching algebra in third grade. <laughs> We're waiting far too late to do that, but that's another topic on another show. But, but my point is you have a heart that is to keep moving forward and you're young enough to get involved in politics and you're smart enough to do the right thing. Uh, and uh, we need you. We really, really do need you to get in there because we have so many people who have sold out yeah. to corporate America. And we're talking about journalists have sold out, senators have sold out, presidents have sold out. I'm tired of hearing yippee i -yay, Cal Patty over and over again. I've heard it enough. Bernie Sanders was a breath fresh air. I needed to hear that. That inspired me. That was honesty. It was transparent. One thing that I will say about Bernie Sanders that's much like you, when he walked on stage, you could see Bernie and his wife. When he walked off stage, you could see Bernie and his wife. Everywhere that man went, you could see the power of him and yet the power of his wife. And that's what I've seen in you. You and your wife, you love each other. They're hand in hand all the time. It's been a wonderful thing to testify of. You know, I, I love that. My wife and I have been talking about that. Uh, we've been talking about, wow, Arn Raw and his wife, they truly love each other, and that impresses us so, so much. We're compassionist, and we make a big deal over uh, people who know how to love and have a good, healthy relationship. And so... Well, thank you very much for that. But you know, in all fairness, most places that Trump goes, his wife eventually shows up at least five paces behind him carrying the luggage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you talk about you know being and patriotic, probably the hairspray. 
<laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Trump reminds me of, you know, the shock jock gets in to be president. I mean, he's funny. I mean, some of the things that he says, I love listening to his rants, not for the sake of him being president, but just to listen to, you know, what is the shock jock going to do today? The thing that troubles me, uh, it may go south real quick. It probably will. And that scares me. And so we do need someone like a, a Bernie Sanders, who's not about war. We don't need yeah. a Hillary Clinton. Um, she's too much of a hawk. Uh, Bernie's more of a guy that's saying, wow, we need to focus in on what education does for the economy, does for the person, first of all. Yeah. Because educated people, they correct me if I'm wrong, but educated people, they, uh, they, they have lives that are more fruitful. Therefore, uh, they probably will be more fulfilled in life. Yeah, and and I got to add to this. I mean, I, I, uh, I knew this woman who lived in the Soviet Union when it was the Soviet Union. Right. And she identified as a communist. And she said that what beat uh, communism wasn't superior military power. What beat communism was color TV. That the United States had a better standard of living and Russians could see it. Right. You know, and so that was the influence. We need to be focusing. I don't think we need to be, you know, be pointing guns at everybody and say that, you know, we're, we're, you know, don't mess with us because we're this terrifying. I think we need to be, we turn the focus back to raising the standard of living. We had the highest standard of living in the world. And after having been to 20 some odd countries in the last couple of years, I don't think we have the highest standard of living anymore because I've been to a lot of other places that are way nice, you know. Yeah. And when you were talking about patriotism, I wanted to add something to that too. We do this Pledge of Allegiance, you know, and uh, I, I've been protesting the Pledge of Allegiance just for its inclusion of, you know, under God, which was added, you know, some many years after the Pledge. Of, you know, we, we've seen the old cartoon reels of Porky Pig you know, giving the pledge without that part in it. But really, I have a problem with the pledge itself in its original form, because this is an oath that people should not be taking. You're, you're, you're promising that you're going to support your country no matter what it does. Now, people that are all about the Second Amendment should understand this better than most. I mean, why do you need to have your guns? Why does the Second Amendment tell you that you should have, that you should have your guns? Just because you're, you're supposed to be, because the militia is armed, you should be armed. And this is, I mean, this is the, the, the I think, the favored interpretation of that, right? That you're supposed to be able to protect yourself against your own government. Obviously then, you can't also swear that you're going to support the government in whatever it does. So you're going to hold the government accountable, right? That's, ideally, that's what the, the Second Amendment is about. So I, don't, I see there being a contradiction in this oath-taking, in this pledge. I don't think that it's patriotic to give that pledge. I think you need to hold the government accountable. You need to control what it's doing. You need uh, to pull back on the reins. I mean, if, if Hillary had won the election, she was not ideal. We all have disagreements, right? I mean, really nobody's ideal. I mean, I, would, I had differences with, uh, with Bernie even. They were just tr relatively trivial and things that could be worked out easily. But if Hillary had won, we wouldn't be in as bad a situation as we are now. And she at least has shown that in the past she has changed her position when popular demand forced her to do that. And, you know, so that means that she's at least somebody that can be reasoned with, where I'm sorry to say that the current regime, we have somebody that won't even, he won't even attend his own intelligence briefings because he doesn't need intelligence. Well, I don't know what we're going to do with that. <laughs> but, but you see what I'm saying about the way that government is supposed to serve the people and not the people ser serving the government. And another one last point that I'd like to throw out there, just to make sure I get it out on the show. I mean, the founding fathers were complaining uh, in 1776 that you know you can't allow corporations to hold power, and that already at their time, corporations were already challenging the power of the state. And so this is where we're at. We've, we we warned about you know when fascism comes to America that it would be wrapped in a flag and carrying it across. Well, it's here. Right, and the founding fathers warned us about banks, and they warned us about corporations, and we didn't listen to any of those warnings. And look where we're at. Everything that they warned that that was going to happen, 
has happened, and now how do we fix it? Now we've got seemingly insurmountable odds, further complicated by, you know, by dwindling resources and uh, a, a hastening severity of, of uh, environmental situation. If you become a senator, I'd like to request something. Certainly. Please. Okay. I would like for you to rethink or possibly think about um, doing away with minimum wage and put in its place a maximum wage in that uh, let's say that we had business A. The guy at the top couldn't make, let's say, a certain percentage over the guy at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So what you want is uh, some kind of regulation that takes us back to the 1950s for the, the, the way that it used to be that a, uh, a CEO of a company might make 10 times what his uh, entry-level people make, whereas now he makes 500 times what his entry-level people make. Right. Yes, I, I can understand what you. I wouldn't. I wouldn't get away uh, with with minimum wage. I mean, I'm open to. I'm open to have anybody counsel me on anything, and I'm open. I, I will probably change my mind if somebody can show me a valid reason why I should do this or that, or why I should support this or that. I want to be open to that. But so far, at this point, I would say that the minimum wage has a justification for staying, and I, I like your provision on the maximum wage. Um, well, I'm simply saying, you know, if, let's say, uh, a person that the company that makes, let's say, $10 million a year, and you have guys there making $7.50 an hour, I mean, something's wrong with that. Um, there's got to be something that gives us a sense of balance. I'm looking for equity, not so much equality. E equality fails. Uh, we, we have a picture around here that we share with people, and it shows these three guys standing uh, outside the baseball fence. And uh, the tall gentleman, he can look over the fence without, you know, anything underneath his feet. The second guy, he needs one box. The third guy, he needs, I think, two or three boxes. He's real short, so he needs more than the other. It's like at a zoo. All the animals don't need the same amount of food. Uh, a hippopotamus needs a little bit more food than a bird. And so that's what equity is about. And I, I think that uh, there is a way to establish equity in a community, uh, something that would be a little bit more realistic than just equality. Giving everyone the same amount of money doesn't make sense to me. I, I think that we need to look at uh, something in the context of equity. What, what say you? Well, I... I'm not sure about the model that you're talking about there, or how. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. When they establish what uh, what a living wage should be across the board, I don't have any objection to that. And I understand that in in different places you're going to have a different amount required. I mean, like I, I lived in places in Arizona where, in the 1990s, you could buy a four bedroom house with a pool for thirty five thousand dollars, you know, and that's in, that's in good condition. All and at the same time, you couldn't afford an apartment. Right you know, in New York for that a month, right? So I understand there's some variance there. Keep talking. I'm going to find this picture real quick. <laughs> we just have a couple of minutes. You're getting ready to go to uh, dinner with your wife. That should be marvelous, wonderful, yeah, and I we just, are so proud for you. And thank you. I just, I just want to state for myself that, uh, I mean, a lot of people will think that because of my position on other things that they, you know, that, that I, they, they want to think in dichotomies and they think, okay, well, you're, if you're not a, a, a hard right wing, then you're a hard left wing. And of course, they don't, they don't consider that there's a middle ground at all. Right. Uh, they, they berate the middle being, you know, liberal for being, that's a, an evil position too. They don't look at what, what the policies are, what the motivation is. And what my thing is, I'm about the people and I want to raise the middle class. I want to raise the, the standard of living for everybody. And the first thing that I consider when I go to a, a different country and I, and I see the, you know, the, the people on the streets, I'm judging how, how well that country does, you know, how fair they are to their citizenry. And, and um, I think that the minimum requirement that you should have of, a, of an effective government is whether your mother can still get her, her prescriptions at the grocery store. Right. You know, because if she can't, and you have anything to do with that, then it's because you've messed up the environment, you've messed up the economy, you've me you've messed up health care, you know, you you've messed up the, the the criminal system. What you know, you know, 
you, you've fallen into a totalitarian state or, a, or a, right. a complete bankrupt collapse, whatever it is, if you can't maintain the, the simple necessities that everybody needs, not just wants, but that everybody needs to be comfortable and happy as a bare minimum, you know, that's my standard. And it should be about the life of the people, right. how well we live. And that, I think, is our primary concern. I don't care about getting more oil out of the Middle East and every other criminal thing that we are accused of doing to go about that end. Right. You know, we should be focusing on home and making things better here. Okay, I'm going to ask my cameraman to come up here. Rick, could you? Uh, I want you to give us a picture of this, focus in on this. This is what I'm talking about, the difference between equality and equity. I think it's a powerful pick. Uh, I think Aaron Ra will really like this. Okay, tell me when you're ready. Okay, I'm just going to turn it around just like it is. I just have to see it on my laptop. Okay, zoom in on it. Just pull, pull in tight. Pull in tight. Pull in tight. Focus that thing. Yeah, there you go. See, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah. pull back. Okay. You know, the difference between equity and equality, you give everyone the same box. Okay. The short guy, he still can't watch the ball game. And to me, in a sense, that's what's going on in America. So many people have been left behind generation after generation after generation. They don't stand a chance without getting at least two boxes right now. And we need politicians in there that will give some people two boxes, other people one box, and another person, hey, you're doing just fine. In other words, arguments for equity are very complicated, but it's, you know, I don't think that the ball game can be won just making an argument of equity. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yes, no, I, I would have to take this under expert advice. For example, when, when Bernie started making his, uh, pro his proposal for how he was going to do, you know, tuition-free college and right. how he was going to you know, do the, the NHS for us, if he could put that together. Uh, uh, oh, where was I going with that? <laughs> I had a senior moment. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, people were saying that it was impossible to finance these things. There's no way to get the funding for it, right? Right. But then I started seeing where, uh, you know, all these economists, I mean, they were naming a handful of economists, and then they, they show a list of 170 top economists, and they're all saying that Bernie's plan is the best of everybody out there. Right. Well, I'm going to, like I said, take it expert advice. And if you, you have all of these economists, or the, all the top economists, and everybody's saying that Bernie's plan is good, I'm going to... They've got the expertise. I would take their advice in supporting the plan the way they're, they're, they're talking about. I need to be open to negotiation, especially when I don't have the fluency that I do in my own area of expertise. Right. Hey, it's been fun having you here in Pensacola. We're going to see you in the morning, but uh, you have a wonderful dinner with your wife, and we love you so much. Um, you don't know how much all of us are for you. You have been a blessing to us. Uh, I mean, walking downtown with you last night as we were filming, looking at all of those places. I mean, people turning theaters into a church. It, it's like a con job. You know, come in here and, uh, you know, we're going to be hipsters for Jesus. <laughs> and then yeah. we're going to get you saved. <laughs> and then the people across the street, they're doing the boring stuff. I, I just don't like the con. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, all the lies of Christianity. Perhaps we can do that on your show. I'd yeah. like to talk about why I think Christianity is harmful. Yeah, well, another week or so, and we'll, I'll have you on my podcast. Sounds good. Right. Hey, love it, you. Was a, it was a delight being here, sir. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks. Take care. Well